Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of a series of eight distinguished public lectures being given in conjunction with a course entitled Gateways to Emergent Behavior in Science and Society. That I'm David Pines, and my co-organizer, co-teacher of the course is Alex Dvrotsky, who's sitting there. Uh, we're very pleased that Ivan Smalia could be with us this evening. His title, as you can see, is Smart Materials for a Sustainable Future. Uh, Ivan is a condensed matter theorist who got his degree, at uh, his PhD at Kent State, following an undergraduate career in Lviv, and I guess a year or so there before making the transition to Ohio. And he made a most successful transition. Uh, after getting his PhD, he was a postdoc for a year there with the working on liquid crystals. He then received a very early postdoctoral appointment from the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter, which is one of the sponsors of this series. ICAM, and it's, one of its directors is sitting in the front row, Daniel Cox. Uh, Ivan is a major ICAM success story. He uh, worked on a joint postdoc between Kent State and the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and then from that position went to his present position as a tenure-track assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's received a number of quite significant honors. Let me mention two of them, uh, which are really quite special. Well, there, there are more than two. Let me mention a half dozen of them. Okay. <laughs> After getting his ICAM fellowship, which is quite a special thing in and of itself, because the idea of the fellowship is that you, are a, you serve as a kind of exchange boson, an exchange particle between two different research groups, often in two different fields and at two different institutions. And this he had a wonderful time doing. After that, he became a senior investigator of the Liquid Crystals Materials Research Center, he received an award from NSF DARPA Photonics Technology, and you'll under, uh, technology access program, no less, and went on to get an NSF career award. He was kind of selected as a founding fellow of RISEI, whatever that might be, or it could be Royal Astronomical <laughs> Society for Extraterrestrial <laughs> Intelligence, right? Okay. <laughs> and then a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, PICAS, and finally, he's been selected for the National Academy of Sciences, Cavalry Frontiers of Science Symposium. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ivan as the first of our eight distinguished public lecturers. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much, David, for this very nice introduction. I'm very honored and pleased to be here today. And, uh, um, I hope I'll be able to share with you um, a story how smart materials could help us um, um, in achieving sustainable future. So uh, uh, RACI actually means um, Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute. and. Um, uh, in addition to being a physics uh, professor at uh, CU Boulder, I'm also uh, a fellow of RACI. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> what I would like to start today from is uh, to just remind you that this year, population um, of uh, um, the, the global population achieved uh, uh, 7 billion, right? So. Uh, you can see that population will further grow, and most of that growth is in developing countries. Right? Now, um, um, 
the last billion of people added uh, in 12 years, last 4 billion people have been added in 50 years, uh, and uh, um, 150 babies are born pretty much every minute, right? So why do I mention those facts? How are they related to renewable and sustainable energy and sustainable future? Well, obviously, um, the uh, newborn baby, babies will be new consumers of uh, energy. And um, uh, if we take a look at um, the energy consumption, um, you can notice some uh, interesting facts that uh, in developed nations, the consumption of energy is actually 14 times or so larger than that in uh, uh, developing nations, right? So developed nations consume much more energy per capita as compared to developing nations. Um, and um, uh, <coughs> so this is um, um, fairly recent statistics. Um, and uh, it does have important consequences because as population is growing further and uh, people around the globe uh, want to have better lives, um, they will consume more and more energy, right? So we do need, therefore, to satisfy uh, those energy needs. Now, another interesting look at statistics that we can take is shown in here where we have a comparison between um, um, the um, CO2 emissions uh, of United States and China, right? And so you can see in the United States, the emissions are somewhat flat uh, during the last several decades. Um, and uh, those are emissions per capita, but uh, uh, in China, we do see some growth, right? Um, which is pretty significant. Uh, now, uh, recently, China actually um, surpassed the United States in terms of the uh, CO2 emissions, uh, and uh, uh, those are the numbers in kilotons for uh, China and U.S., and um, uh, as you can, you can see from this graph in here, uh, the CO2 emissions uh, of China are growing very fast. This is pretty steep curve that we can see in here. Those are overall emissions, right, due to country with um, over billion population. Uh, and um, uh, this map in here shows uh, the statistics of CO2 emissions around the globe. Um, you can see that the other big emitter is uh, India, for example, and uh, uh, in there, too, we see quite significant growth of CO2 emissions. Now, um, we have, therefore, a really big challenge, right? Because on one hand, we do need to have, um, uh, to satisfy those needs of growing needs of energy of growing population, right? And population that will want to have better and better life uh, and therefore will demand more energy. Um, uh, so energy consumption will grow significantly. This, this is um, uh, some statistics or some projections taken from a PNES article by uh, Nate Lewis and Nasera. Um, and so you can see that uh, the, the energy needs uh, in uh, 2050, uh, global energy needs, will be roughly um, <clears throat> 28 terawatt, right? Now, uh, who remembers what, uh, uh, what tera means? Is it 10 to power 12? Very good, yeah? So this is a huge number, right? It's 12 zeros there. <laughs> Uh, and this is what uh, we consume right now, right? So we need to uh, increase, uh, so the energy consumption may increase significantly several times uh, in just several decades. Uh, <coughs> so we do need to be able to satisfy those energy needs if we will have them. And at the same time, um, we should satisfy them uh, <coughs> um, in a climate neutral or carbon neutral way, right? In such a way that um, um, uh, that's uh, sustainable, right? Uh, um, and so if you take a look, a closer look, what we have on this slide, um, so the big 
fraction of the energy um, comes from oil, gas, coal, right? So perhaps we can, um, <clears throat> even if we keep uh, <clears throat> those non-renewables in the energy uh, distribution in 2050, we need to fill in this part um, and what those energy sources will be. As I already mentioned, uh, for sustainable future, we need to have carbon neutral or uh, climate neutral energy sources. Uh, and uh, the other approach you might say uh, could be um, sustainable too if we were to simply decrease the energy needs that are projected um, in this graph, right? So suppose we would develop uh, energy efficient technologies uh, that would allow us to um, you know, consume say half of that um, projected number in here in 2050, right? And that would help a lot too. And so um, um, this therefore brings, brings me to uh, this slide in here uh, where I think uh, we have um, um, two different approaches in addressing this grand challenge related to energy and uh, a sustainable future. One is uh, uh, new energy sources that would, uh, would be climate neutral uh, or carbon neutral. The other one is uh, uh, related to a better, more efficient use of energy, right? And so uh, uh, in terms of, in my presentation, uh, in terms of the new sources of energy, I'll mostly focus on photovoltaics and uh, in particular uh, on quite unconventional photovoltaics that we would not think that much about just several years ago, right? Um, so those will be mostly not just regular solar cells that we already see on um, roofs of our buildings and also um, in big solar parks like those you can see in here, uh, but uh, um, the uh, solar cells that can be plastic and uh, very inexpensive, but yet uh, produce significant um, amounts of um, uh, electricity and satisfy our needs. In terms of uh, the um, <clears throat> addressing the problems related to energy efficiency, um, I think a lot can be done, right? Um, uh, because uh, if you simply recall that just several, several years ago, we all were using uh, CRT displays, right? Um, uh, nowadays, we uh, mostly use liquid crystal displays, and those are much, much more efficient. However, there is still big room for improvement in efficiency of uh, liquid crystal displays and other um, <coughs> technologies um, uh, related to um, uh, everyday uh, <coughs> devices that, that we use in our every, everyday life. Um, the other example that I will focus in my talk is related to uh, the efficiency of energy use in buildings, right? So this is nothing else but just infrared picture of a house. And what it tells us that a lot of energy is lost through windows, right? And uh, also through doors and uh, walls of the buildings, if we were to able make those buildings much more efficient, right, um, um, then we would be able to save um, a significant fraction of energy. So in a building, 30% of energy is lost through windows on average in the United States, a significant fraction. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, but, uh, you know, this picture is taken probably during the winter time, right? If you were to take um, uh, a similar picture uh, during the summer, you would realize that windows are a big problem during the summer too because the heat leaks to the buildings and then we need to use a lot of conditioning as well, again, spending energy. Um, and so uh, if we were to be able to control the flow of energy through windows, we would be able to save a lot of energy. Now, how do we approach uh, 
So let me get to some details. Um, so what uh, I show in here uh, is the solar radiation spectrum, right? Um, the black curve that you can see uh, shown in here is um, mm. Um, uh, the black body radiation uh, and uh, the sunlight uh, that um, uh, you, the spectrum of the sunlight that you would be able to measure uh, at the top levels uh, of atmosphere would be the yellow part. Now what gets to the earth is uh, shown here in red and uh, obviously you, you probably know that uh, uh, those lines you can see in here is due to absorption of um, um, different gases and uh, uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, sun provides apparently enough energy to satisfy all our energy needs. If we were to be able to harvest this energy and convert it to usable sources of energy and electricity. Um, now, however, how do we do it uh, again? in a sustainable way. Um, so the conventional silicon solar cells are the most common approach, right? And it's an uh, approach that has been around for quite some time already. Uh, we can see those um, solar cells on the roofs. We use them in calculators, for example. Um, and uh, uh, they are already very mature, very efficient technology, right? We need to um, um, accept the fact that uh, this is really um, uh, very good, very uh, mature technology. Uh, now, the graphs you can see in here show us where the solar cells, conventional solar cells are manufactured. Um, a lot of them are manufactured, you can see in China, Taiwan, Japan, in Asia, right? Uh, and this chart in here tells us where mostly those solar cells are being installed. And uh, an interesting uh, observation that uh, you probably notice immediately, um, over 50% of them are in Germany, right? Um, uh, and um, um, now, not that many in China, which would be uh, the major manufacturer of the solar cells, right? Not that many actually in USA, uh, so uh, these statistics on this slide probably tells you already that technology itself is not the only thing that we need in order to make those technologies work for sustainable future, right? So the reason why uh, such a uh, large number of photovoltaic solar cells is installed uh, uh, in Germany is because uh, uh, the government has a lot of subsidies and uh, support for the use of uh, solar cells uh, in this country. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, one of the barriers um, related to installing a solar cell on, on your roof or um, other uses of solar cells is the initial investment, right? Because uh, the solar cells are pretty expensive and you need to invest in the very beginning uh, a significant amount by purchasing a, a solar cell uh, and installing it, right? And then it will pay back somewhat uh, over a pretty long period of time. Um, now, if you were to calculate the cost uh, of electricity that's uh, produced by photovoltaic solar cells and compare that to uh, other sources of energy, um, um, you know, for example, due to coal and gas, uh, you would realize that the solar uh, electricity due to conversion of uh, solar energy is still much more expensive, right? However, uh, the price is decreasing uh, this time. Uh, and um, um, uh, you can see that projections show that even if uh, nothing significant happens in the development of new technologies, the solar cells, the electricity produced by solar cells will still become less expensive eventually, right? Compared to 
uh, the electricity due to coal or uh, gas sources. Uh, <clears throat> um, one of the reasons is because the more cells, uh, the more solar cells are manufactured, the less expensive they become. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> these statistics in particular in here uh, gives us an evidence of this. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, however, uh, there is a big hope that new technologies uh, will allow us to achieve those goals even faster, uh, right? And uh, um, further decrease the cost of uh, electricity um, due to conversion of solar energy. Uh, now, before I proceed in discussion uh, what could be those uh, different kinds of solar cells, let me just give you um, a brief introduction into uh, what is the efficiency of solar cells. Uh, so typically it's calculated um, as a general electrical power divided by the incident light power. So in other words, how much of the uh, solar energy you actually convert to the usable um, uh, electrical power or usable energy in the form of electricity. Uh, and so 100% uh, uh, of efficiency is typically not possible to achieve, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> now, uh, uh, the 20% efficiency is achievable in um, commercial solar cells uh, that are um, based on um, silicon. Um, however, this is expensive material which makes the solar cells expensive, which requires very significant initial investment uh, and therefore um, many people simply can't afford. Therefore, we do not install as many solar cells as we possibly could, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's possible to have 33% of efficiency uh, in the space grade solar cells, but again, um, you know, those are extremely expensive and um, you, you would not install them on your um, rooftop of your house. Um, now, the uh, multi-crystalline silicon solar cells are much less expensive. Their efficiency is roughly 10% only, right? Uh, but um, the solar cells made of this uh, uh, polycrystalline silicon are relatively affordable, uh, and therefore uh, there is no need of that large initial investment, right? So this is important to keep the 10% um, of efficiency is good enough uh, for you to use uh, the solar cells pretty much on, on daily basis and eventually pay back for the costs of energy, uh, 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 costs of the solar cell in the long term. Um, um, so this number is already very good, right? Now, uh, <coughs> the... Um, uh, photovoltaic uh, principle is depicted here in, in this uh, slide. Uh, I know that uh, most of you have physics background, as, uh, as I understand, or science background, uh, background in sciences, and um, uh, I hope that you know about P-type and N-type semiconductors uh, and the uh, PN junction uh, that um, is formed in here uh, in the solar cell. Then we have electrodes. Um, so one of the electrodes uh, is uh, mostly transparent to let, uh, let the sunlight uh, um, <coughs> get into the solar cell and uh, generate uh, the carriers at the PN junction, um, which um, uh, then go to the electrodes and uh, we can use um, uh, the uh <coughs> Uh, to use the solar cell to power uh, bulbs or uh, other uh, devices. <coughs> um, so um, uh, again, we have in here the negative electrode, the positive electrode, the PN junction, which is essentially the interface between uh, the uh, um, differently doped semiconductors um, the donor and acceptor and uh, 
the PN junction um, is uh, the interface at which we generate the carriers. Now, uh, uh, as I already mentioned, the main problem why uh, we don't use uh, the, those type of solar cells that widely is uh, the initial investment, right? So uh, uh, in here, this, this graph in here uh, shows you uh, the cost of um, the fuel investment and also operation maintenance, maintenance for different sources of uh, um, um, energy and in particular electricity. And you can see that the initial investment is huge in the case of solar cell. And although we don't have any spendings for fuel uh, and the uh, maintenance is not that expensive, but uh, uh, this in initial investment um, makes it very difficult uh, to deploy uh, the uh, conventional solar cell technology. So if you were to be able to produce very inexpensive solar cell, uh, this technology you know, would be on pretty much every roof and um, you know, there would be a significant breakthrough uh, in terms of using more sustainable forms of energy um, in particular. Uh, in I, just, um, I just want to make a point that I've heard very different numbers mm -hmm. than the numbers you're showing here. Um, so that one has to be, um, there are a lot of numbers coming around often biased towards what particular energy you want to use, right? And uh, in particular, uh, this shows wind is more expensive than the others. Uh, typically, wind is believed on a large wind farm at least to be pretty competitive, mm -hmm. like again, you know, six cents per kilowatt hour mm -hmm. or something like that. And nuclear, because of capital investment, but because of the, the infrastructure costs up front, is usually more expensive. So, this depends on how, on how you've done the estimates. Absolutely. So I just want to throw a note of caution out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree because uh, there are different wind farms, right? And it, right. it highly depends on um, many different factors. I totally agree. Um, but, um, um, well, just one main point I want to make in here is that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, deployment of uh, solar cells would be much easier if there would be no, if the initial investment would not be that high, right? right? Uh, That's yeah, and, and so uh, now uh, uh, I want to show this statistics which tells us about uh, the efficiency of the solar cells, different kinds of solar cells, right? So, so far what I showed to you was uh, the very conventional ones that we all are very familiar with. But uh, there are many different other solar cell technologies. Um, and so uh, uh, the one I will focus on uh, today is actually in the very bottom in here. Uh, it's called organic photovoltaics or plastic solar cells, right? So you can see that efficiencies of those solar cells started really low. Um, and however, there is a significant improvement of efficiency uh, of plastic solar cells during the last several years. Uh, and although they are much lower than what we get, uh, for example, for single crystal silicon, but uh, you probably already realize we will not need that significant initial investment in the case of those solar cells. Um, and so um, um, my Colleagues at RACI uh, uh, often like to show this, this chart, that, um, this graph that I have in here, uh, where they distinguish three different generations of solar cells, right? The first generation is the solar cells we have discussed based on uh, the single crystal silicon and uh, um, um, other um, uh, polycrystalline silicon. Uh, now, uh, um, the second generation that you can see in here uh, includes um, organic photovoltaics, um, includes cadmium telluride, includes diasynthesized solar cells. You can see that uh, uh, the total cost, uh, due, you know, related to those solar cells can be much lower, right? Um, and uh, uh, although the efficiencies are typically not that high, 
um, you um, still can keep the cost fairly low. Uh, and so um, uh, this is, those are the solar cells, uh, you know, many people are developing currently, right? Um, uh, but they also include the third generation solar cells um, and uh, uh, those include um, hot carriers, multiple exciton generation or MAC for short, uh, multi-junction solar cells. Um, and so the efficiency can be much higher. They can also produce relatively inexpensive electricity. All right, and so uh, um, <clears throat> now what I want to mention is that uh, um, some of um, thin film solar cells like organic photovoltaics, um, they, uh, um, th there are uh, different types of solar cells that do not necessarily fall into the second generation or third generation. They are somewhere in between. Right, because uh, they can take advantage of uh, multiple uh, different processes that we discuss in here. Uh, and, um, um, and so, as you can see, although the conventional solar cells that we have here in the first generation uh, of photovoltaics uh, still give us uh, electricity that's more expensive, as you can compare to the uh, uh, electricity obtained due to uh, fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> um, but uh, uh, the second generation and third generation solar cells will be able to provide much less expensive electricity, therefore more competitive uh, with uh, um, the other sources of energy that are less carbon neutral, right? And so today I want to, uh, you know, in my first part of talk, I want to discuss the organic photovoltaic solar cells that can be very inexpensive because uh, they are made out of materials that can be solvent processed um, and um, 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 materials that are quite inexpensive. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'll discuss you the recent developments in the technology and then science related to those solar cells. But what I want to start from is um, um, give you a little bit of historical background um, because, uh, uh, you know, several decades ago when people first started using organic materials for uh, solar cells, they were able to produce uh, efficiencies only of about 1%, right, very low efficiencies. Uh, so the, the solar cells they were using at that time were pretty much mimicking uh, the conventional solar cells because again one would have a PN junction in this case by using uh, different uh, organic compounds. Uh, I don't know if you can see the chemical structure of the examples I wanted to provide in there, uh, but uh, um, um, <coughs> The PN junction, which is very similar to conventional solar cells in this particular case, uh, was um, um, between two uh, uh, films of chemical compounds um, that you can see in here. Um, and um, uh, the efficiencies were pretty low. So in a sense, uh, this was quite discouraging for some time uh, because um, <coughs> The process related to, um, to generation of electricity by such a, um, a PN junction uh, solar cell uh, made of uh, two organic compounds is, is fairly complicated. Um, uh, it starts so obviously from light absorption and formation of exciton, then exciton diffusion uh, to the donor acceptor interface uh, the charge transfer and uh, formation of charge transfer complex at the interface, charge separation into free hole and electron, uh, and then uh, charge transport to the electrodes uh, and uh, charge injection into the electrodes, right? So if, uh, uh, <coughs> the efficiency of this process was fairly low. 
Now, in the next generation of the um, organic photovoltaic solar cells, which were first demonstrated in 1995, um, there was a very different approach uh, adopted. Instead of forming a PN junction at the flat interface, uh, what was uh, done in this case is a bulk heterojunction right, between the uh, donor and acceptor materials. Um, and so in this case, what we have is, again, two electrodes, uh, and then here is a glass substrate one of the electrodes is obviously transparent. Um, and then we have interconnected network of um, uh, the donor and acceptor, right? And so uh, uh, the uh, scales, the length scales in here uh, are on the order of tens of nanometers, right? And so um, then we again have absorption of light uh, the generation of exciton, diffusion of excitons to uh, the, the interface between donor and acceptor, separation, and eventually this result in generation of electricity. Now, what's important to understand is that uh, this network is indeed interconnected, and uh, uh, we have sort of highways uh, for electrons and, and holes generated in different parts of this bulk heterojunction. Um, and uh, um, so this was very, um, uh, quite difficult to achieve. And to some extent, it was um, uh, <coughs> um, 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 it was achieved to large extent by accident, right? And so what was realized is that uh, uh, the fullerin uh, it's a very good acceptor uh, and can separate from uh, the polymers, many polymers that can act as donors uh, and, and form those uh, interconnected networks on the tens of nanometer length scales, which then resulted in much better efficiencies as we will uh, see a little bit later. Now, uh, uh, if you were to now take uh, uh, free structure, uh, um, cryogenic um, electron microscopy image uh, and uh, uh, you would be able to see uh, what we depict uh, in those schematics, right? So we have uh, those fibrillar structures of uh, the polymer, which in this particular plastic solar cell is uh, P3HT, uh, this particular polymer, right? So uh, whatever you have, uh, uh, in parentheses with number N is a unit that's repeated N times in the polymer structure, right? And then uh, the acceptor is PCBM. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, essentially a fullerene uh, with um, this structure. Uh, and so uh, um, if you were now to uh, filter the image, energy filter the image for sulfur, uh, you again would see that uh, uh, the, the phase separation between the two components is on nanometer scales, right? And so... Uh, you can't uh, read the white scale bar there. So what is the, what is the white scale bar? Uh, I believe it's 100 nanometers. 100 nanometers. Okay. Uh, and so... Um, um, <clears throat> now... Uh, um, the length scale between the phase separated domains is very important. Um, and so typically uh, it, it has to be uh, optimized to be roughly two times the exciton diffusion lens, right? Because uh, uh, if, if this length scale is much larger, um, then um, uh, the excitons will not diffuse to interface and um, um, uh, and uh, the, the um, charges will be lost. Um, um, and um, the, the domain size and topology must also inhibit the carrier recombination. Um, so yes, there is um, an optimum size, which as I already mentioned, uh, is roughly the two times of the uh, accident diffusion. Um, 
when the domain size is too large, uh, then we have poor exciton dissociation. When domain size is too small, um, then um, we have excessive recombination. And both of those two extremes are not good. So there is an optimum domain size which can be achieved uh, by uh, processing the uh, PCBM, P3HT mixtures by different solvents and uh, achieving the phase separation just on right length scales, right? And so uh, ideally, essentially, we would want to have morphology uh, of the solar cell that the, that's depicted in here, right, where we would have channels uh, running through the cell thickness and uh, um, uh, we would have uh, acceptor and donor domains uh, with uh, uh, the lateral size comparable to the exciton diffusion. Um, and um, um, so uh, uh, the uh, very common approaches in uh, fabrication uh, <clears throat> and design of the solar cells uh, include, as I already mentioned, uh, the donor materials, which are typically polymers, uh, similar to the ones I'm showing in here, and then acceptor materials, which uh, almost universally would involve fullerene C60 or C70, as I'll show a little bit later. It turns out C C70 uh, is working uh, a little bit better than, than C60. Um, and then uh, because the uh, donor and acceptor parts of the bulk heterojunction junction phase separate, uh, the, um, you know, we, we do have some sort of highways for the charges then to um, uh, go to, to the electrodes. Um, and uh, although the typical uh, heterojunction junction probably looks something like this, you know, this would be obviously most ideal. Um, but, but this is uh, uh, the best, you know, one can do so far. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, the C60 and C70, uh, currently C70 um, are most common um, acceptor uh, materials for the bulk heterojunction solar cells. Uh, this shows us the development which is fairly recent in, in the field of plastic solar cells uh, where currently uh, the solar cells can plastic solar cells can last fairly long period of time uh, and uh, can be produced fairly easily in form of uh, flexible uh, thin films like the ones you can see in here. If you look at what happens with the efficiency of plastic solar cells, there is a dramatic growth of efficiency during the last several years. Um, and so I, I was showing you that, uh, you know, like two decades ago, um, the uh, efficiency standard for plastic solar cells was 1% or so. Uh, you can see that already in 2009, we had, we had um, uh, roughly 6.4. Uh, 2009, um, a little bit later, in the end of the year, was already 7.9. Um, in the mid of last year, 10.5 um, efficiency, which as you can see is comparable to the efficiency of uh, polycrystalline silicon has been achieved, right? And so what's also important to see in here is that those good efficiencies are actually achieved by companies, not in the research labs, uh, because uh, the companies are highly motivated to produce products, right, that uh, would then, um, um, you know, uh, do well on the market. And in all of those recent advancements, uh, the um, the uh, acceptor material that was used was universally um, PCBM uh, C70, shown in here. Uh, and, and this is a press release related to this record uh, efficiency of 10.5% uh, 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 that we have discussed. So uh, let us take um, um, a quick look how the plastic solar cells work, the bulk heterojunctions work. So uh, um, you already recognize the basic structure of the plastic solar cell. 
that we discussed uh, before that involves uh, um, <coughs> the transparent electrode and uh, um, the whole transport layer um, and the transparent substrate in here. Uh, <coughs> but now uh, um, somewhere in, uh, in, in the bulk of the material in here, we have um, an event of absorption um, that then results in diffusion of the resulting excitant to the interface between the donor and acceptor, uh, which um, results in charges, the hole and, and the electron that are then uh, uh, being uh, <coughs> migrating to the electrodes uh, um, and um, um, <coughs> resulting in, in the uh, electricity uh, <coughs> that we can use for the purposes, um, uh, all kinds of purposes. Uh, and so uh, uh, this, sum, this slide in here essentially summarizes the structure uh, of the, uh, the plastic solar cells. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, the, the two materials that you can see are most typical materials, the PCBM and PCHT, uh, the very typical materials of uh, organic photovoltaic plastic solar cells. I, I have to mention that uh, uh, you know some of those record deficiencies due to uh, the companies that I showed before might have been obtained with different materials. You know they are not necessarily always revealed. Uh, you know what their technology is based on. <coughs> um, Okay, all right, so now uh, uh, one important thing to mention is that uh, the fabrication of pl uh, plastic solar cells is much easier than fabrication of conventional silicon solar cells uh, because uh, you don't need uh, any sort of fabrication steps in vacuum. Um, you don't need hot metal deposition onto uh, organic layers. Um, <coughs> Um, uh, so one can individually optimize different layers uh, and uh, can also obtain self-encapsulated device. Uh, it's compatible with uh, the flexible substrates that we can use. Uh, and uh, in particular in here, uh, we show that one can do lamination of um, um, the organic photovoltaic solar cells to achieve the flexible um, solar uh, cell films. There are different ways of uh, uh, different structures of devices. Um, the normal and inverted uh, structures that you can see in here that have um, uh, different layer structure. But I'm thinking that maybe I'll uh, skip the details right now just because uh, um, I, we already spent a significant fraction of the lecture. Um, uh, instead, I, I will uh, want to show a couple more examples of um, um, uh, the industrial developments of plastic solar cells. So on this slide, you can see some of the major players uh, in the plastic solar cell industry. Uh, and uh, in particular, one of the major players is uh, Konarka um, that uh, uh, has um, a big plant in um, New Bedford in Massachusetts. Um, <coughs> and you can see the manufacturing lines where uh, the pl plastic solar cells are being manufactured in here. Now, uh, you can buy um, many products with plastic solar cells, in particular in Denver Airport. Um, on the way here, I was able to see such, uh, uh, such um, Echo Traveler solar backpack uh, that you see on this slide. And uh, uh, you know, if, uh, it can generate electricity and charge your laptop or uh, phone uh, while you're traveling. Uh, um, the, also, there are Sorry, plastic. Question. Yeah. Question. How, how easily do you get damaged? 
uh, how easy to damage. Um, well, I don't have personal experience, but yeah, well, you know, it's pretty um, um, durable material, I think, you know, the, uh, the plastic films used here should be pretty good, you know, long lasting. But under, what is one of the concerns is that under solar radiation, uh, how long do they last? Oh, that, that is not a major problem at all. Uh, you know, they, they have been tested for, uh, you know, like um, uh, you have seen on one of the slides, much larger than a year, much more than a year, right? And uh, it means different, um, might, might mean five years in one case, 10 years in the other case. Obviously, uh, uh, many of those things are just being developed. Right. So they have not been tested in real conditions. They, they have been somehow tested by those companies in, um, you know. It's just that one of the critiques that's sometimes made, which I know the organic photovoltaic people push back on, is that the durability of the organic photovoltaics is not as long, although they are very cheap, where silicon photovoltaics in the last 20, 40, 50 years, perhaps. So um, even though they're more expensive, you may get a, you know, Better payout in the long run. That's one of the arguments. I'm not saying it's mm -hmm. right, but it's one of the arguments. Yeah, one of the questions is are they cheap enough to replace easily yeah. once a year like batteries? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. When they yeah. get to that level, who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Do these exhibit, uh, does this type exhibit this kind of fall off and in efficiency that then saturates? I forget what the effect is, but there's a classic thing that happens to some of the solar cells where they, they drop and then. As a function of what? As a function of exposure to light. Oh, exposure, yeah. what, What's that phenomenon? It's a, it's a German name on it or something. I think. You don't, you know what I mean? It's actually burning. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, as a function of time, I think that uh, in many of those cases, the efficiency still would would have to be tested, but uh, it does not change significantly, right? It doesn't go um, down order of magnitude or something like that. But there might be some minor changes. Um, all right, so um, uh, in here you can see some other commercial available products um, and, um, you know, plastic solar cells on tents, on parking lots, um, and uh, a bus, stop, I think. bus stop station, exactly, here, parking lot. Uh, also as part of decoration, decoration of buildings. Right? So if, uh, if those get so inexpensive that, you know, you can spend 100 bucks and just decorate your house, and that still generates electricity for you, you know, why, you know, if you even have to replace it every year or so, you know, not a big problem, right? Um, <coughs> All right, so um, um, now uh, um, it would be still great to push the efficiency of the plastic solar cells even further up, right? Uh, because currently this, those 10% are absolute records. Most of the products you will be able to buy will be actually maybe like three, four, five percent efficient, right? Because not everybody can uh, compete with Mitsubishi Corporation that got this record. Um, and, uh, you know, it does not also mean that in every single cell they, they will sell to customers, you will have that efficiency. Um, now, uh, uh, what are the ways of uh, further improving uh, the uh, efficiency of solar cells? Uh, one of the approaches that uh, is um, um, pursued by quite a few people uh, recently, in particular by uh, Zhao Van Helahemat at uh, Enrol, with whom we collaborate, is to use uh, plasmonic metal nanoparticles uh, in order to enhance the photoconversion processes um, um, by, um, by, by means of those nanoparticles. Right? And so, um, um, <clears throat> if, you know, typically in the solar cells that I was showing to you, the thickness is on the order of 100 nanometers, right? Obviously, if you were to be able to increase that thickness, you would be able to absorb more light, right? So that more light could be potentially converted to more electricity, but because the distance between electrodes 
uh, is much larger um, uh, then if, if your cell gets too sick, uh, <clears throat> then there is uh, lots of recombination and uh, um, you know, uh, the cell becomes less efficient. Uh, now, instead of increasing the thickness, if you were to be able to simply increase absorption and conversion to uh, electricity that way, uh, that would be much more efficient way of doing it and the metal nanoparticles can uh, mediate this process uh, <clears throat> uh, because they can enhance by many orders of magnitude the, uh, uh, the electric field of um, light um, as it's being absorbed and you can even have uh, multi-photon absorption in those cases. Uh, and um, one uh, can generate uh, nanoparticles that would have surface plasma resonance in different part of optical spectrum that's uh, of interest from the standpoint of view of uh, the absorption of sunlight. Uh, <clears throat> um, and so in order to be able to do it, one for example could use nanorods that have different aspect ratio and as you were to increase the aspect ratio uh, then the longitudinal uh, uh, surface plasma resonance peak would simply shift uh, toward the infrared part of the optical spectrum, right? And so in terms of the use of um, the plasmonic nano nanoparticles, um, one can adopt a couple different approaches. Um, <clears throat> you know, so the, this, uh, those couple images actually um, taken from a recent article by, uh, in Nature Materials by Atwater and Pullman where um, they discussed how the plasmonic nanoparticles could be used directly to enhance the field, right? And, and so for the conventional um, <coughs> solar cell, uh, they would be right at the PN junction. Uh, in the case of plastic solar cells, they would be at the interface between the donor and acceptor regions, right, uh, of the bulk junction, uh, and uh, you know, doing the sim sim similar kind of function, uh, but they can be also used um, as a so as a sources of forward scattering um, and uh, um, <coughs> the light trapping by plasmon wave guiding, uh, and in in all of those three examples. Um, they can further enhance efficiency by um, keeping the cell, uh, the plastic solar cell thickness uh, small enough uh, and yet um, have a significant amount of light absorbed in the material, right? Because, for example, if you have uh, the forward scattering process like the one in here, uh, the light uh, pass uh, within the, the solar cell increases and that uh, increases the chance of absorption um, uh, within the, um, <coughs> uh, the solar cell. Okay, so, uh, so far we discussed how um, um, the solar cells, in particular plastic solar cells, could be used for um, uh, as alternative sources of carbon neutral sources of energy, right? Climate neutral sources of energy. Um, what I want to discuss in the remaining part of uh, my lecture, and let me just quickly check uh, how I'm doing in time. Okay, all right. Um, uh, is um, I would like to discuss um, <coughs> uh, the uh, energy saving and harvesting uh, uh, technologies related to the use of, um, of liquid crystal. Uh, and just a couple examples we will be able to focus on is more efficient displays, uh, windows with tunable transparency, uh, and, and that includes uh, transparency in visible part of spectrum and also in the infrared part of spectrum. Uh, <clears throat> and um, um, combination, potential combination of solar cells and uh, tunable windows uh, combination of solar cells and displays, right? And so I'll discuss a 
in a little bit more details, um, you know, what um, uh, approaches could be adopted in order to increase efficiency, further increase efficiency of our displays, right, which includes, for example, laptop computer that would make the batteries last even much, much longer. Um, <coughs> and, um, um, uh, and so, um, but before I, I uh, proceed with that, I would like to give you a little bit of introduction into liquid crystals, right? So liquid crystals are unique states of matter that stand between isotropic fluids and uh, crystalline solids um, because they uh, combine some degrees of uh, ordering, uh, which can be orientational ordering only or partial positional ordering um, with the fluidity, right? So they can flow like liquids, but at the same time, they do have uh, orientational and partial positional ordering too. Sometimes just orientational or partial positional ordering as well. Uh, the liquid crystals are typically comprised of uh, an isotropic building blocks like rod-like molecules, disc-like molecules, banana-shaped molecules, molecules that are not very symmetric, not um, um, that, that have highly anisotropic shapes. Now, the interactions between those building blocks often lead to formation of uh, the liquid crystal phases, like the pneumatic liquid crystal phase and columnar liquid crystal phase that you can see in here. Right? And it's the structure of those building blocks that largely determines what kind of behavior you obtain um, for those materials. And so uh, the very common, most conventional uh, liquid crystals are called pneumatic liquid crystals that you can see in here, where you have no positional ordering at all, right? But you do have orientational ordering. The molecules are free to move with respect to each other, but they do need to preserve uh, this uh, average uh, orientational ordering being parallel to each other as they flow, uh, the material flows and uh, the molecules move with respect to each other. And so uh, this liquid crystal is formed by rod-shaped molecules. Uh, and the one you can see in here is formed by very different uh, molecules which are disc-shaped, right? And so in this case, however, you still can see that the average orientation of normals to those disc-shaped molecules is also um, the same for all of them, uh, which is normal to the screen. Now, the molecules you can see in the very bottom part of the slide show the typical chemical compounds that are used to realize those phases, right? And the little r's in here stand for radicals, so it can be, for example, hydrocarbon chains attached to such a, a core that you can see in here. Now, uh, um, uh, what's important also to mention is that uh, one can have more molecules with uh, chiral carbon centers, like the one in here, which make those molecules uh, losing their mirror symmetry. And therefore, uh, they tend to assemble into so-called cholesteric phases, where locally uh, the assembly of those molecules is very similar to that, uh, what we saw in the pneumatic phase, but as you would move along this helical axis, you would see them twisting with respect to each other uh, and forming this helical structure uh, where the distance over which they twist by uh, 360 degrees is called cholesteric pitch, right? Now, uh, uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, the reason uh, they're forming those structures is the lack of mirror symmetry, right? Which is, in this particular case of this molecule, due to presence of uh, this um, uh, carbon, carbon chiral center in here, uh, and uh, uh, the very similar molecule that uh, does not have this uh, chiral center um, is um, um, uh, not showing the uh, twisting structures, right? <coughs> now, um, it's important to mention that uh, this uh, helical structure uh, and tendency to twist 
can lead to uh, a number of interesting phases that can form. For example, the so-called cholestatic blue phases where the building block is the so-called double twist cylinder where molecules twist from the center to periphery in all radial directions, right, by forming this double twist cylinder. And then you can imagine packing those double twist cylinders into cubic lattices, like the one you can see in here, and you can produce uh, body-centered and face-centered cubic lattices this way. Uh, and uh, what you obtain as a result of packing of those double twist cylinders uh, is a network of defects, right? Because uh, you cannot fill in the entire volume uh, of the unit cell perfectly by just double twist cylinders. You will have to produce defects or regions with um, reduced order um, uh, in, uh, in such a unit cell. And those are shown in here by, um, by the red lines. Uh, <coughs> Now, uh, um, um, and, and they are in the regions where you have interconnection between um, the different double twist cylinders. However, what's important and interesting uh, to, to uh, mention here is that this periodicity in the cubic lattice uh, of the blue phase or in cholesteric phase uh, of liquid crystals can be comparable to the wavelengths of light, right? Uh, and so therefore you can have selective reflection of colors uh, that you can see in here for those monocrystals uh, of blue phase uh, being formed uh, as you would uh, cool the material uh, uh, from high temperature when it would be in isotropic state to lower temperature. Uh, very slowly you would form those kind of crystallites. Right, and so um, uh, the uh, beautiful reflection colors in here, as I already mentioned, are due to selective reflections of polycrystals of this uh, blue phase. Right, now um, um, uh, because those materials are uh, in a liquid crystal state, we all know that we can switch the displays of liquid crystals uh, by applying very low voltages of roughly one volt or so. We can uh, switch liquid crystal the same way. Uh, we could do it also in here and eliminate the selective reflection or uh, have it um, returning back. And therefore, uh, perhaps that could be one way of um, controlling the transparency um, uh, <coughs> of um, uh, of windows, right? Uh, <clears throat> by controlling the selective reflection of light, and uh, since um, uh, the uh, the selective reflection is dependent on periodicity, which in cholesteric liquid crystals can be controlled by controlling cholesteric pitch, we can do it in either visible part of spectrum or in the infrared part of spectrum. Um, but we will return to this point a little bit later uh, during the lecture. Um, however, the other class of um, materials that we already discussed before are polymers. Sorry, sorry, you mind, can I have one second? So the idea is to eliminate some radiative losses through the, the windows. But what about just um, heat transport um, through the windows? So obviously you, 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 you combine with like double pane windows and so on. Uh, right, I mean, you, make the, the windows as, as, as good as possible for uh, insulation and heat transport, and you have this as an added feature for, um, for radiative, uh, either trapping radiation in in the wintertime or mm -hmm. um, keeping it out in the summertime. Got it, okay. All right, thanks. Um, so, another thing I don't know if films that you put on your window that absorb the transfer a lot without cutting down on the light too much. Yeah, so the actually in the market there are quite a lot of films that are not switchable at all. But yeah, but but the, yeah, but but uh, you know the 
uh, beauty of some of the approaches that can be provided by liquid crystals and liquid crystal polymer composites is that uh, depending on the need, you could you know, uh, uh, change uh, the uh, transparency in what's visible the, infrared. What's the technology in eyeglasses? Uh, pardon? What's the technology in eyeglasses, the ones that darken as you go outside? Ah, so there is um, uh, e tint, you mean those kind of? The ones that change from being transition. Electrochromic ones? Uh, I don't think there's any, um, there's, no, there's no power supply to those, right? They're just, no. uh, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there are, there are uh, the glasses with controlled transparency which are based on liquid crystal. And uh, there is a company called uh, Alpha Micron Inc. which develops those. Uh, so you can tune transparency, you know, from, um, you know, 100%, almost 100% to 10% or so. Uh, and uh, uh, they can also produce plastic films that can be laminated in principle on the windows, right? But then, uh, you know, the only effect that you, that you uh, get in this case is you absorb light, which is then re-emitted, you know, the heat is re-emitted in different directions. So they, they, you know, in that way they are maybe a bit less efficient. Uh, but, uh, you know, this technology related to uh, <coughs> um, the eyeglasses with uh, tunable transparency where you can also get different colors depending on the need, right, of, of the glasses. Uh, um, I think it's very mature and you, you can buy um, skiing goggles, for example, uh, and um, goggles uh, like motorcycle goggles, uh, helmets with, with those already. Uh, all right, so um, uh, uh, the um, mesogenic polymers that I want to show in here are um, also composed of anisotropic building blocks. Um, <coughs> and um, um, the uh, polymers, therefore, can also form a number of liquid crystal phases where uh, you would have orientational ordering or also partial positional ordering of those building blocks, right? So the only difference compared to what we saw before is that now those uh, mesogenic anisotropic units are interconnected with each other uh, through the polymer network. Um, <clears throat> and so I think I'm running a little bit faster than, let me see how much, um, 10 minutes. I, I probably need to run a little bit faster than I originally thought about. Um, uh, but um, you can form a number of different liquid crystal phases uh, uh, from the polymer networks. And uh, one interesting example is the so-called liquid crystal elastomers, uh, where the mesogenic units are fairly loosely connected with each other uh, in such a way that they can rotate, uh, but they cannot move very far from each other. And therefore, uh, the mechanical, uh, there is mechanical coupling between orientational ordering uh, and uh, uh, the shape uh, or mechanical properties of uh, the elastomers. And so, uh, for example, when going from disordered state to uh, liquid crystal ordered state, uh, the shape of those can change and therefore uh, uh, they are thought as candidates for artificial muscle applications, for example. Um, and uh, the, um, um, <coughs> um, one can obtain, for example, 300% of strain by uh, changing the temperature when going from between isotropic and ordered pneumatic-like states. Um, now, what uh, uh, we all know about liquid crystals uh, is that uh, they are very responsive to external fields, right? As we already discussed before, typically they are formed by molecules that have molecular dipoles, right? And uh, um, uh, then when we apply external fields, um, we do have difference in uh, dielectric constants between uh, 
uh, for uh, electric field orientations parallel or perpendicular to uh, the liquid crystal director and uh, um, we can use this coupling to switch liquid crystals, right? So because there is a difference uh, between the, uh, the electric constants, we can realign liquid crystals in fairly low electric field. In materials with positive dielectric anisotropy, we typically align uh, the anisotropic molecules um, uh, to be in field parallel to the field direction while in materials with negative dielectric anisotropy uh, where epsilon parallel is uh, smaller than uh, epsilon perpendicular measured perpendicular to liquid crystal director or molecular orientation direction then the uh, molecules and the liquid crystal director align perpendicular to the electric field direction. Um, and so uh, uh, this, uh, those approaches are therefore uh, utilized in all kinds of liquid crystal displays, right? So the most simple display um, would then involve um, a liquid crystal cell where you have a layer of liquid crystal between two electrodes and then as you apply electric field, uh, the molecules tend to rotate you know, if you have a material with positive dielectric anisotropy, tend to rotate toward the field direction, uh, which then changes the optical uh, um, response because if you place such a liquid crystal film between crossed polarizers, um, then um, uh, you, um, uh, you can tune the transmission of light this way, right? And so uh, uh, now, the other form of a display that we can see in here uh, is when uh, you treat the surfaces of um, the liquid crystal cell in such a way that molecules at the opposite substrates tend to align uh, in perpendicular directions, right? So in this direction at this surface and in this direction at this surface of the uh, confining glass plates of liquid crystal cell um, so uh, when you place such a liquid crystal cell between cross polarizers again, uh, you can have uh, either off state or on state depending on the alignment of polarizers. Uh, um, and uh, as you apply electric field then, uh, it goes to the opposite state, right? Yeah. Because um, uh, when uh, at no field, uh, the polarization of light is following the rotation of liquid crystal director in this twisted geometry. Uh, while when you turn the field on, uh, the, um, uh, <coughs> the molecules in the liquid crystal director align parallel to the electric field and therefore no light um, can pass through the cross polarizers or if you have parallel polarizers, uh, then all light passes through, right? And so um, this is another um, conventional, uh, widely spread display mode that we uh, typically utilize. And um, um, you know, the, uh, what, what we have is shown in here on those schematics again, something that I just discussed, this following of polarization of light, of linearly polarized light, uh, as it passes through the liquid crystal film in such a display, right? Now, um, what you realize by looking at those display modes is that in all of them, we use polarizing films, right? So uh, what that practically means is that at least 50% of backlight is lost, right? Just because of presence of those displays, because uh, the way those display modes um, uh, operate is by using polarized light, right? And um, um, <clears throat> yet another type of display mode is shown in here where we have in-plane electrodes that are on the one, uh, only on one uh, substrate of the uh, liquid crystal display or liquid crystal cell. Uh, and then initial orientation of the liquid crystal director or molecules is at some angle like 45 degrees with respect to uh, the patterned electrodes that you have in here 
when you then apply electric field, you rotate liquid crystal director and with that you change response and the amount of light that's passing through the liquid crystal pixel in the display, right? But again, in order to make this display function, you again need uh, two polarizing thin films uh, that cause uh, significant losses in, in light. One more example, you know, which again utilizes uh, the polarizers uh, is uh, probably the most widely spread uh, liquid crystal um, display mode called PVA mode, uh, or patterned vertical alignment mode, where you, know, you have initially vertical alignment, but this material is now with negative dielectric anisotropy, right? So those molecules want to tend, want to align perpendicular to electric field lines when you apply electric field. And so as you apply electric field, therefore they tilt in different directions and uh, um, you know, uh, let light uh, pass through the system of two cross polarizers, which they don't in the off state uh, when they are perfectly aligned uh, normally to the, to the liquid crystal cell of the display. Um, and so in this, this, this case, they pass and, and you know, light leaks through, through the liquid crystal display. But again, 50% of that light is being lost, right? So we just reviewed pretty much all major uh, modes of display operation that are currently there. And you can see that 50% of your backlight uh, uh, produced in the display is simply lost because of presence of two polarizing films. Um, and so the question is, well, what if we were to be able to somehow recycle that light, either convert it back to electricity, uh, or maybe avoid usage of uh, polarizing films um, that would um, improve the efficiency of such a display. Um, and so maybe I'll skip this one, but um, uh, just because we are running out of time, but um, um, you know, one way of uh, achieving this goal is by using the so-called um, uh, the gas host display in, uh, in, in there are different uh, modes of operation of those where you can use just one polarizer or no polarizers at all. Um, and so the idea in here is that uh, uh, one uses the dye molecules in the liquid crystal itself uh, and um, uh, uh, then the, because those are dichroic uh, dye molecules, the absorption uh, of light depends on orientation of those molecules with respect to the direction of incidence of light. Uh, and so uh, a lot of light would be absorbed, for example, in this case when you have polarized incident light uh, and with dichroic dye molecules having their transition dipoles of absorption parallel to the polarization direction. Uh, while if you apply field and align all of them perpendicular to the substrates, those dye molecules pretty much uh, do not absorb at all and uh, they let the light passing through, right? And so uh, now uh, you can have uh, either one kind of dye in the liquid crystal or different kinds of dyes uh, and with that you can um, uh, uh, you know, change the color uh, of the light transmitted through it. So, um, um, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, most conventional displays, like the one I have, for example, in my laptop computer, we do have red, green, and blue pixels, right, which you would be able to see if you use a magnifying glass or a simple microscope. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you were to have a right choice of dyes in those particular cases, uh, in principle, you can also avoid the use of those filters too, right? Which is again, further improvement in, in efficiency. Um, then the other approach um, which um, um, can be utilized is called cholesteric reflective displays, which in principle do not require backlight because uh, you utilize the incident light in this particular case. Uh, and so those can be twist, uh, switched between 
uh, the helical structure uh, which reflects certain color, right, because the periodicity of uh, this helical structure can be controlled to have the uh, breath, breath uh, reflection conditions met for different wavelengths of light, uh, and therefore you can achieve different colors. Or you can also apply fields and uh, cause um, uh, the structures that strongly scatter light, so they would uh, appear uh, whitish uh, in this particular case, right? And so, um, uh, again, the advantage is that uh, in this case you don't require polarizers and uh, you don't require backlight, essentially, too. Uh, obviously, the, the, this type of display wouldn't be possible to use in a dark room, uh, however, right? So it's um, not universally uh, applicable for uh, all kinds of applications. Um, but um, uh, <coughs> um, I've, yeah, so let me just rush through then. <laughs> um, so I, I just had a couple examples of, um, you know, the, uh, th this was overview, uh, uh, but um, uh, of the display technologies, but um, the examples I had um, are related to the bistable displays that do not require um, the use of electricity um, uh, uh, for uh, applications such as signs, which can be switched only when you need to change uh, the information on the sign, uh, only then you apply electricity. So those are some of the examples you can see in here. Um, and uh, uh, the other type of uh, switching I wanted to discuss is uh, the so-called polymer dispersed liquid crystals where you have droplets of liquid crystal in a polymer matrix and uh, uh, they act essentially as tunable fog uh, because you can control the um, uh, refractive index mismatch between the droplet and polymer matrix and in one case when you apply field and align all of them there is no mismatch and therefore the film is transparent while in the other case uh, when there is no field applied uh, there is a lot of mismatch in refractive index between the polymer and the liquid crystal droplets. And they scatter a lot of light, so uh, uh, they, they appear milky, right? And so essentially you can tune the transparency this way and uh, control the amount of light reflected or transmitted through such films, and they can uh, be utilized as um, PDLC, polymer dispersed liquid crystal, uh, smart windows that can control, uh, a, a, you know, transparency and uh, 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 also used as privacy windows too. Um, the uh, other type of uh, polymer encapsulated uh, liquid crystal displays um, uh, developed by Ken Display to, um, uh, Inc. is uh, um, the um, polymer encapsulated cholesteric liquid crystals where the uh, colors are, that are being reflected are again dependent on the cholesteric pitch of the cholesteric liquid crystal and you can um, imagine having um, you know tiny uh, uh, droplets of liquid crystal in the polymer network that can be then switched uh, uh, so this uh, is just to show you the um, encapsulation of those which uh, um, involves um, UV curable um, polymers and results in, in tiny droplets of liquid crystals um, that phase separate from the polymer network and then can be uh, encapsulated in the polymer matrix and switched by applying low voltage external fields. Um, now currently you can buy those uh, skins uh, that can change color, right? So I'm sure that uh, it's probably not important for guys, but girls always want to match the color of the phone, you know, um, with the um, skirt or something like that, or the bag. <laughs> and so uh, uh, one way of doing it is to use those uh, switchable skins, but um, again, the reflection can be controlled broadly in visible and infrared part of spectrum. And so you can envision 
controlling the uh, transmission of uh, um, you know energy flow in visible and infrared spectrum and so they, they can be applied for a number of applications related to saving of energy due to windows and uh, walls and, and so on and so on. And because you can also switch colors in a very nice way, the, you know, those kind of systems are fairly compatible with you know, new modern ar architectural designs. So they might be attractive from this standpoint of view too. So, so here I had some examples of conventional um, you know, films that are used for improvement of efficiency of windows, but uh, I just wanted to compare, but I guess I have to rush uh, because um, you know, I also wanted to discuss one more example of uh, uh, using liquid crystals in, uh, in windows applications where uh, one could actually harvest energy uh, using windows, right? And this would involve uh, using dye molecules um, dispersed in a liquid crystal uh, in between the glass surfaces uh, and also using a very efficient solar cell at the edges where uh, the light would be uh, re-emitting, um, you know, in the liquid crystal matrix uh, and then uh, being harvested by this quite efficient solar cell. Um, and so um, there is a, a company in Netherlands which uh, is commercializing this technology already. And one of my collaborators, Dick Brohr from uh, Eindhoven Institute of Technology, um, is uh, uh, very active in, in development of the system. So the idea is to route the light re-emitted by dyes to the solar cell, which is efficient and somewhere in here. And for that, again, we can use the polymer liquid crystal network that we have discussed before that's polymerized and cross-linked. And because of the structure of liquid crystal, um, it, you know, the, the um, um, uh, light would be directed towards the solar cell rather than re-emitted backward. Um, now, um, uh, obviously, uh, you might ask me, uh, well, what do we do with uh, uh, the part of solar spectrum in the infrared and how can we control? Uh, because, you know, no good dyes in that part of spectrum with absorption in that part of spectrum. But fortunately, many plasmonic particles uh, and examples are shown in here, um, you know, can serve this prop, pur purpose and uh, they can be aligned in liquid crystal. Um, and, you know, I just showed some examples of those in here. And uh, in a similar way, they can be put into the cholesteric structured film. Um, I don't have enough time to discuss in details the images I show in here, but the idea is you have a helical twisted structure where the alignment of uh, gold nanoparticles like nanorods that you have seen on the previous slide follows the alignment of liquid crystal and uh, you know you can uh, use them in a similar way as um, we use dyes and you know therefore can, can control um, harvesting and uh, flow of energy through uh, windows for example. So I just want to conclude um, by, um, you know, going back to this challenge slide uh, related to 28 terawatt of energy by 2050. And I think that uh, by using energy efficient technologies, we can significantly reduce projected uh, use of energy by 2050 and also uh, make sure that uh, the um, new sources of energy are more uh, climate neutral or carbon neutral as well. Now, what I want to end with is with a short advertisement of uh, a, a summer school that we organize in Boulder, which will take place from July 16 to August 11. So it's four weeks in Boulder. Um, and uh, it's uh, designed for graduate students um, um, where you could learn much, much more about what we have discussed today and, and about many other types of solar cells and technologies 
Um, and uh, uh, so the applications uh, can be submitted pretty much right away. We do have some support for graduate students uh, and uh, in, uh, ICAM, the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter, is uh, a sponsor of this summer school. Um, and uh, um, uh, so um, I hope to see many of you in Boulder and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I will have a couple more slides um, which you know I can probably leave in here in case if you will want to learn more about school. But in any case, I highly encourage that you visit the web page and um, uh, learn about it. Thank you for your attention. Questions. Uh, Ivan clearly could have gone on for another hour, probably. I, I admire the audience. You're all still here. Uh, it says a great deal to your powers of persuasion. Uh, I think you certainly got a twofer tonight, if not a threefer. Uh, why don't we ask? Uh, let me ask the audience. Let's have one, two questions. This is a, I remember the name of that effect. It's a stabler Ronsky effect. Mm -hmm. Do you know that one? Um, no, no. It's a, uh, well, I, I, it's going to be limited to a Marcus cell. But it's, it has to do with the interaction of the defects, maybe the hydrogen that is inevitably put in the Marcus silicon mm -hmm. photovoltaic cell. And the, the efficiency goes down with, with exposure and then stabilizes. Mm -hmm. But I think in that there's a certain not certain sort of defect character in these mm -hmm. things we were talking about, and I wonder if anybody ever talked about it. Because one of the goals of the Marcus silicon cells is to minimize the state of effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it it uh, it leads to a sort of uh, running in of the yeah. of the mm -hmm. thing in which the efficiency goes. Um, regarding the, uh, the organic photovoltaics, um, I'm wondering if you could give me a sense for um, the break-even point between, you know, between the organic and the, the one that was next up. So I think that the organic, I don't remember what it was, maybe near somewhere around 1 or 2% in efficiency and then the next one was something like 10%, I'm not sure. But I'm curious about how they perform, like, um, as far as, uh, you know, when you break even with them. You mean sort of the cost per kilowatt? Yeah, count. exactly. It's like the efficiency to the cost. Like if, if one, say, 1% one efficiency and one's 10, but then, you know, say, is one like 10 times more in price or 20 times more in price? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, um, so um, um, the first organic photovoltaic solar cells were only 1% efficient, right? And nobody, uh, they were pretty much analogous to conventional, uh, you know, silicon-based solar cells where you have P-type and N-type semiconductors and interface in between. So those were kind of uh, modeled after the, the conventional solar cells. And you would have uh, two organic layers P-type and N-type, right, and an interface in between them. Uh, nobody is pursuing this technology anymore because uh, uh, due to many reasons and due to the fact that your interface, the area of the interface is fairly small, right? It's, nobody is pursuing this technology right now. While the organic photovoltaics, which are based on bulk heterojunction, right, where you have this uh, nanoscale, um, phase separated system, right, uh, with the, the different domains being on the order of tens of nanometers, uh, the interfacial area in there is much larger, right? And uh, the efficiency that have been demonstrated, the record efficiency is 10.5%. So those are, um, you know, I think currently most promising uh, solar cells out of organic photovoltaics. Right now, we can compare organic photovoltaics with inorganic, like you know, amorphous silica based. You can see that best 
organic photovoltaics already uh, approached the, the efficiency of amorphous silica solar cell, right? They are mu much less expensive, but at the same time, the durability might be better in the case of amorphous silica, right? That, that you know, those studies here still need to be done. You know, so uh, in short term, you know, the initial investment is much larger in the case of uh, the amorphous silica solar cell. Um, the plastic solar cells are much less expensive. But on the other hand, yes, uh, you know, the amorphous silica-based solar cell will likely last much longer, right? So over long term, maybe they will break even, as you mentioned, right? And then it will be, uh, it will be a question, what's important for the um, customer or consumers? Is it uh, important to not to have this big initial investment or, you know, is it important to be sure that over the course of many years of, of the, uh, that this solar cell works, it gives you best possible outcome, you know? So those questions are not that always easy to answer because the costs depend also how, on how many cells you manufacture. Are they manufactured in China or you know, in US, you know, there are many different issues coming into play. Thank you again, Ivan. Thank you. Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of a series of eight distinguished public lectures being given in conjunction with a course entitled Gateways to Emergent Behavior in Science and Society. That I'm David Pines, and my co-organizer, co-teacher of the course is Alex Dabrotsky, who's sitting there. Uh, we're very pleased that Ivan Smalia could be with us this evening. His title, as you can see, is Smart Materials for a Sustainable Future. Uh, Ivan is a condensed matter theorist who got his degree, at uh, his PhD at Kent State, following an undergraduate career in Lviv and I guess a year or so there before making the transition to Ohio. And he made a most successful transition. Uh, after getting his PhD, he was a postdoc for a year there with the, working on liquid crystals. He then received a very early postdoctoral appointment from the Institute for Complex Adaptive Matter, which is one of the sponsors of this series. ICAM, and it's, one of its directors is sitting in the front row, Daniel Cox. Uh, Ivan is a major ICAM success story. He uh, worked on a joint postdoc between Kent State and the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and then from that position went to his present position as a tenure track assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's received a number of quite significant honors. Let me mention two of them, uh, which are really quite special. Well, there, there are more than two. Let me mention a half dozen of them, okay. <laughs> After getting his ICAM fellowship, which is quite a special thing in and of itself because the idea of the fellowship is that you 
are a, you serve as a kind of exchange boson, an exchange particle between two different research groups, often in two different fields and at two different institutions. And this he had a wonderful time doing. After that, he became a senior investigator of the Liquid Crystals Materials Research Center. He received an award from NSF DARPA Photonics Technology, and you'll under, uh, technology access program, no less, and went on to get an NSF career award. He was kind of selected as a founding fellow of RISEI, whatever that might be, or it could be Royal Astronomical <laughs> Society for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, right? <laughs> okay. And then a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, PICAS, and finally, he's been selected for the National Academy of Sciences Cavalry Frontiers of Science Symposium. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ivan as the first of our eight distinguished public lecturers. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, David, for this very nice introduction. I'm very honored and pleased to be here today. And, uh, um, I hope I'll be able to share with you um, a story how smart materials could help us um, um, uh, in achieving sustainable future. So the uh, RACI actually means um, Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute and um, uh, in addition to being a physics uh, professor at uh, CU Boulder, I'm also uh, a fellow of RACI um, and um, um <clears throat> what I would like to start today from is uh, to just remind you that this year, population um, of uh, um, the, the global population achieved uh, uh, 7 billion, right? So uh, you can see that population will further grow, and most of that growth is in developing countries, right? Now, um, um, the last billion of people added uh, in 12 years last four billion people have been added in 50 years uh, and uh, um, 150 babies are born pretty much every minute, right? So why do I mention those facts? How are they related to renewable and sustainable energy and sustainable future? Well, obviously, um, the uh, newborn baby, babies will be new consumers of uh, energy and uh, uh, if we take a look at um, the energy consumption, um, you can notice some uh, interesting facts that uh, in developed nations, the consumption of energy is actually 14 times or so larger than that in uh, uh, developing nations, right? So developed nations consume much more energy per capita as compared to developing nations. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> so this is um, um, fairly recent statistics um, and uh, it does have important consequences because as population is growing further and uh, people around the globe uh, want to have better lives, um, they will consume more and more energy, right? So we do need therefore to satisfy uh, those energy needs. Now, another interesting look at statistics that we can take is shown in here where we have a comparison between um, um, the um, CO2 emissions uh, of United States and China, right? And so you can see in the United States the emissions are somewhat flat uh, during the last several decades. Um, and uh, those are emissions per capita, but uh, uh, in China, we do see some growth, right? Um, which is pretty significant. Uh, now, uh, recently, China actually um, surpassed the United States in terms of the uh, CO2 emissions, uh, and uh, uh, those are the numbers in kilotons for uh, China and U.S. And um, uh, as you can you can see from this graph in here, uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, of China are growing very fast. 
this is pretty steep curve that we can see in here. Those are overall emissions, right, due to country with um, over billion population. Uh, and um, uh, this map in here shows uh, the statistics of CO2 emissions around the globe. Um, you can see that the other big emitter is uh, India, for example, and uh, uh, in there too, we see quite significant growth of CO2 emissions. Now, um, we have therefore a really big challenge, right? Because on one hand, we do need to have, um, uh, to satisfy those needs of, growing needs of energy of growing population, right? And population that will want to have better and better life uh, and therefore will demand more energy. Um, uh, so energy consumption will grow significantly. This, this is um, uh, some statistics or some projections taken from a uh, PNES article by uh, Nate Lewis and Nasera. Um, and so you can see that uh, the, the energy needs uh, in uh, 2050, uh, global energy needs will be roughly um, <clears throat> 28 terawatt, right? Now, uh, who remembers what, uh, uh, what tera means? Is it 10 to power 12? Very good, yeah? So this is a huge number, right? It's 12 zeros there. <coughs> Uh, and this is what uh, we consume right now, right? So we need to uh, increase, uh, so the energy consumption may increase significantly several times uh, in just several decades. Uh, <coughs> so we do need to be able to satisfy those energy needs if we will have them. And at the same time, um, we should satisfy them uh, <coughs> um, in a climate neutral or carbon neutral way, right? In such a way that um, uh, CRT displays, right? Um, uh, nowadays, we uh, mostly use liquid crystal displays and those are much, much more efficient. However, there is still big room for improvement in efficiency of uh, liquid crystal displays and other um, <coughs> technologies um, uh, related to um, uh, everyday uh, <coughs> devices that, that we use in our everyday life. Um, the other example that I will focus in my talk is related to uh, the efficiency of energy use in buildings, right? So this is nothing else but just infrared picture of a house. And what it tells us that a lot of energy is lost through windows, right? And uh, also through doors and uh, walls of the buildings. If we were to able make those buildings much more efficient, right, um, um, then we would be able to save um, a significant fraction of energy. So in a building, 30% of energy is lost through windows on average in the United States, a significant fraction. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, but, uh, you know, this picture is taken probably during the winter time, right? If you were to take um, uh, a similar picture uh, during the summer, you would realize that windows are a big problem during the summer too because the heat leaks to the buildings and then we need to use a lot of conditioning as well, again, spending energy. Um, and so uh, if we were to be able to control the flow of energy through windows, we would be able to save a lot of energy. Now, how do we approach? Um, so let me get to some details. Um, so what uh, I show in here uh, is the solar radiation spectrum, right? Um, the black curve that you can see uh, shown in here is um, um, uh, the black body radiation uh, and uh, the sunlight uh, that um, uh, you, the spectrum of the sunlight that you would be able to measure uh, at the top levels uh, of atmosphere would be the yellow part. Now what gets to the earth is uh, shown here in red and uh, 
Obviously, you, you probably know that uh, uh, those lines you can see in here is due to absorption of um, um, different gases and uh, uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, now, uh, uh, sun provides apparently enough energy to satisfy all our energy needs if we were to be able to harvest this energy and convert it to usable sources of energy and electricity. Um, now, however, how do we do it uh, um, uh, that's uh, sustainable, right? Uh, um, and so if you take a look, a closer look, what we have on this slide, um, so the big fraction of the energy um, comes from oil, gas, coal, right? So perhaps we can, um, <clears throat> even if we keep uh, <clears throat> those non-renewables in the energy uh, distribution in 2050, we need to fill in this part um, and what those energy sources will be. As I already mentioned, uh, for sustainable future, we need to have carbon neutral or uh, climate neutral energy sources. Uh, and uh, the other approach you might say uh, could be um, sustainable too if we were to simply decrease the energy needs that are projected um, in this graph, right? So suppose we would develop uh, energy efficient technologies uh, that would allow us to, um, you know, consume say half of that um, projected number in here in 2050, right? And that would help a lot too. And so um, um, this therefore brings, brings me to uh, this slide in here, uh, where I think uh, we have um, um, two different approaches in addressing this grand challenge related to energy and uh, a sustainable future. One is uh, uh, new energy sources that would, uh, would be climate neutral uh, or carbon neutral. The other one is uh, uh, related to uh, better more efficient use of energy, right? And so uh, uh, in terms of, in my presentation, uh, in terms of the new sources of energy, I'll mostly focus on photovoltaics and uh, in particular uh, on quite unconventional photovoltaics that we would not think that much about just several years ago, right? Um, so those will be mostly not just regular solar cells, that we already see on um, roofs of our buildings and also um, in big solar parks like those you can see in here. Uh, but um, um, the uh, solar cells that can be plastic and uh, very inexpensive, but yet uh, produce significant um, amounts of um, uh, electricity and satisfy our needs. In terms of uh, the um, <clears throat> addressing the problems related to energy efficiency, um, I think a lot can be done, right? Um, because uh, if you simply recall that just several, several years ago, we all were using uh, 